Hello and welcome to another Spectrum Shore special. Once again, I'm talking to Chris Wilkinson, this time about the Crash Live Show. Chris talks about what it took to put on the show, about some of the people who helped and some of the guests. I found it a fascinating insight into what it would take to put on something like that. Towards the end, he talks a little bit about Roger Keane and Ollie Frey and about the fundraising he's doing for the Motor Neuron Disease Charity. Even if you don't listen to the entire interview, I'd suggest you go and support that charity through the Fusion Just Giving page. So on with the interview. Chris, thank you for joining me for another interview, this time about the Crash Live event. The event was a great success. The place looked filled to capacity for a lot of the day. Do you know how many people turned up? Oh, we were tracking the numbers, I think, for some days before the event. We used a thing called Ticket Taylor, which proved to be really, really useful. So I th from, from looking at the records, we, we are just over, I think, 500 people come through the door during the day. And then when you, you add on the, the helpers and the, the people on the stands and family, friends and VIPs. Yeah. So it must have been around, I don't know, maybe 560, 570 people, which was pretty incredible, really, considering they were pretty much all Sinclair fans. So we, we, we were really pleased. Yeah, and a great turnout because there was some there was a train strike that day, wasn't there? Yeah, there, there was a few things that tried to derail us, including the rail strike, which was which was a new thing, which we found out maybe a couple of weeks before the event. So one of the other things um, which people were aware of was that where we host, hosted the event was a uh, Warsaw football ground. So they went and unbeknown to me, being Welsh and a rugby fan, and I don't follow football. They went and won a game, which meant that they were through to the second round of the FA Cup, which I think the FA then enforced that the second round would be played on the 26th of November, which, of course, was the, the date of the event. So we, we had to sort of watch the drawing of fixtures. You know, when they, they pick the balls out of a machine and, and then they say um, Warsaw or whatever, whatever teams were meant to be playing in the second round. So we were praying that Warsaw would play away and, you know, and that wasn't to be. Yep. So it caused a little bit of angst and a little bit of stress, I think, before the event, because we had chosen a different part of the stadium to host Crash Live, which was which was which had a separate Q and A room and a different layout. It had a stage and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So two weeks before the event, we we found Craig and I found ourselves in the position where we weren't hundred percent sure that the event was going to take place. And then when we found out that we they were going to move us to a different part of the stadium, we had to sort of re sort of redesign the event effectively because we had a, a different size and different shaped canvas. So, so for, for five months or so, we, we, we had a vision of, of an event being like this. Yeah. And then for the last two weeks, we had to change that vision and make it work with like the canvas we were given. It meant we, we lost the Q&A room. So we had to create a Q&A area in the event on the day. And we bought sound staging stuff to, to try and block out as much of the outside noise as we possibly could. And it, and it worked to, to quite well. It, it just meant it took some of the space away. But but the venue was a little bit bigger. It meant the fusion area then was split across two different sides, which the original plan was meant to be all in one area, fusion area being everything which is non-Sinclair. Hmm. But it also meant then that the, the evening gig that we were going to do with Anthony and Nicola Coalfield, uh, we, we, we could do it in the same room in front of the stage. And previously we were restricted to a separate room that could only hold around 125 people. So the positive, we were able to open it up mm. and about 170, 180 people stayed for the evening side of things. So that was the benefit of this venue. And of course, many people then who came could actually watch the match if they were interested in Warsaw playing. I think it was Carlisle, wasn't it? So there was a few bumps in the road on the, on the way to this event, which maybe shouldn't have been there really, but but they were. It's about a week ago. We're talking a week later. Now you've had some, some time to reflect. How do you feel the event went on the day? I think what we did on the day was 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 really good. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of there's about two and a half days of setup that we, I think we underestimated how long it would take to tune in. I don't know, 35, 40 year old computers into 35, 40 year old TVs. 
we, we got everything working on the on the Friday. Uh, we got in early on the Saturday morning, and by ten o'clock we were ready to open. So what I did, I went downstairs. Uh, I think one of the security guys said there was a, there was a the car park, you know, well into the car park to the point I couldn't see where the end of the queue was. Yeah. I must, I must admit, I got a little bit emotional seeing that, and I never get emotional. My kids always say to me, "Dad, why don't you cry?" But you know, it was like it was all those people coming to to an event that you know we we were organising. So it, it it was brilliant. So so when we got everybody in, you know, that we, we scanned people in using this little app which is linked to the ticket um, software we were using, and we were always, I've never used it before. So you're always concerned about getting people in, you know, stuck in queues and can't get through and. It, it was seamless. It just went blah bling, blah bling, blah bling, blah bling, and then everybody was sort of ushered towards my other daughter, Amber. Sienna was was on the door welcoming people in, as you said earlier, Jeff, the one with a big smile who smiled all day, and she she, she was she was loving it. And then Amber was giving out um, we call them we call them goodie bags. You know, it was, it was a crash. It was very basic, a crash bag with 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 a copy of Fusion Crash Live in, which was like a magazine some articles you know an introduction uh, an agenda for the talks and if you open up the center pages there was there was a guide of what what was what basically yeah and there was a a badge and and a sticker and all that kind of stuff i mean the room was quite busy before we let people in if you could as i say you can imagine you had all these people on the stalls and all the helpers and and all the people there are part of the whole thing I mean, we made a comment. It's like, crikey, you know, it, it's quite busy before we opened the gates. And when when those first few hundred people streamed in, it's like, I don't know, it's just it was just mentally cool, you know, and and seeing, seeing people walking in and seeing what we what we'd put together, you know. So we had, we had people on the stage and welcoming people in, the projector gaming and all the different themes that we said we would do, we put in place, and all the traders were there. And since then, you know, people were thanking me and it was Chris here and Chris there all throughout the day, you know, everybody wanted to have a chat and, and say how, how cool what we did was. And and then thereafter, there's just been lots and lots and lots of emails and messages of, of, of thanks and, and the social media stuff just went, you know, it, went, it exploded for the week, really, didn't it? I've seen imagery everywhere. So about what we did, about the the guests we had, which I'm sure we'll talk about later, and, and what what a, a Sinclair event would be. You know, it, it's like somebody said to me, I brought back the the ZX Microfair from the 80s, something I'd never gone to. You know, so I didn't even know what one was. You know, being from West Wales, we had nothing like that. You know, <laughs> the the local computer thing was what W H Smiths. You know, a few miles away, that's where you go for all your computer fixes. You put on something you'd like to go to. That's always what I've said, and then you hope that the people who come are come are are sort of in the same kind of mindset as you and, and enjoy the same thing. And 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 it seems like we hit what was the phrase hit the nail on the head. Yeah, it was it was a really really good event. I've seen lots of positive feedback. Actually, one thing I did see some criticism of the sound system. Uh, people at the back couldn't hear. So, so what what we learned from the sound? I mean, the the Q and A room worked. We had a really expensive PA system with four wireless microphones. So, there's a couple of lessons learned. Really, there's the, there's the usage of that kind of system with those kind of mics, where if you bring the mic in front of the speakers, you're going to get feedback. Yeah. You should have let people know they should switch them off, then walk you know a certain distance away from the the, the, the speakers to get to stop the feedback. Those wireless mics had a receiver in the PA which needed to be charged. Um, so we learned that was another learning of the day. So what, what I did then was put a little USB cable from the computer into, into the connector on the receiver, which means it was continually charging so the mics would never die. And the third thing we learned was not everybody's got that kind of tone in their voice that can project. Graham and Paul Dury, when they were talking, can you hear me at the back? Everybody's going, yeah, you know. And then you know, not, not everybody's got that kind of tone, you know, which 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 allows them to to throw their voice into the mic and project it. So uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, th- th- there were some lessons learned. I think we might have still had the same problem in in a, in a in a closed room with at least projection. But the other things were was basically getting to know the system and and how it worked and that kind of feedback problem. You know, if a microphone just about goes in front of a speaker. We learn, we learn all these things for next time. We we were sort of coaching Malcolm to try and project his voice, having had other guests talking and, and seeing that problem. So, you know, next time we'll have a chat with these people in advance, and then you know, and then hopefully it'll improve. 
I was going to ask, did you have time to enjoy the event on the disc? But I think you've pretty much answered that. I'm guessing you didn't get to watch any of the talks or anything, though. I think I was in, I was involved in some of the talks when something wasn't working. And what we what I did was come at the end of the talks and we, we offered signed kind of merchandise. And you could feel the love then coming from the audience towards the, the person, you know, especially Clive and Malcolm and Kevin. You could actually feel it. It was like... I whispered into Malcolm's ear, you know, when he was signing some stuff, can you feel the love in this room for you, you know? So the gentleman was like, he's 78, and I told him I was a 53-year-old fan, and he's saying, don't do that, because that makes me feel really old, <laughs> you know? And we've had sort of uh, feedback from his daughter, you know, he, he got home and was feeling totally overwhelmed by the whole experience, and she thanked everybody, and, you know, there's a nice thread on the Crash group on Facebook where people are pitching, you know, posting pictures and their experiences and the little anecdotes they'd had with Malcolm. I, I enjoyed big parts of it, but I think as an organiser, you're trying to make sure the day runs at, at least, you know, to, to some kind of plan in your head, and that nothing fails, you know, and then people are enjoying themselves, or oh, something's broken, you go and fix it. But I think I appreciated meeting lots of friends I hadn't seen for a while, and uh, I, I loved the feedback. I was I was getting in real time, and then seeing some of these personalities who, who came, and they, they were in awe, really, of the kind of, not feedback, but, you know, when Malcolm saw like 120 people in front of him, and the same for Kevin, and for all the talks, really, and for, for Clive, they, they, they were a little bit dumbstruck, really, and didn't quite know what to say, you know? They weren't expecting that kind of attention, I guess, on the day and people remembering stuff they'd done like 40 odd years ago. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of positive feedback on social media about all about Malcolm Clive and, and Kevin. It was it was it was great. It was great to see them there. Yeah, I think one of your questions could be, you know, how did we pick those guests? And Paul Drury said, leave it with me for Malcolm Evans. He had an idea he'd been talking to Malcolm and, mm. and he said, yeah, Malcolm would love to come. And then I've known Kevin and Clive from... Well, I knew Malcolm as well from previous endeavours like the Spectrum Pixels books and such. So I think uh, I haven't seen Kevin earlier on in the year at the Spectrum 40 event. He, he, he just said yes straight away. He's been a good friend with Clive for many years. He came to the old revival events we did. So, you know, he was trying to pick the right kind of 8-bit kind of legends, I guess, as, as, as I see it. You know, the, it was the games I played. Never played School Days too much. I, I not saw School Days, so I never played uh, Trashman too much. It was always travel with Trashman. So I told, I told Malcolm that. So not a huge football manager fan, but not football, but yeah. um, you you got to appreciate the enormity of that that title. And Saboteur, you know, what's not to like about the Saboteur series? They were, they were brilliant games. I was going to ask, was there anyone you'd have liked to have got there that you weren't able to for some reason? I don't I don't think there was anybody else I asked. Every every idea I had, I was here sitting at my desk thinking, I wonder if, wonder if Jeff and Paul would do a live Spectrum show. Yes, we'll do that. And then, you know, and we talked to some of the guests and they said yes straight away. And in the end, you know, we, we had more more people wanting to do slots than we had slots because, you know, you're, in, you're only doing an event from, say, 10 o'clock till 6 in, in the evening and you're, you're trying to fit in eight, nine different things. And everything runs over, doesn't it? So, and you've got to have leave a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes in between each one. I would have loved to have more guests. If it was a day two, we could have probably had three or four more individuals, but we can keep those in our back pocket for next time. Any names you want to drop, or are you going to keep it a secret, Chris? I'll keep it as well. There's there's no secret to keep, but there's, there's a list, I'm sure. But um, who would you like there to be be there, Jeff? Who would you like to meet? This is this is going to be one that it'll be impossible because I would really have liked to have met Mike Singleton, but of course, with him passing away, that that won't happen. I, I'm not going to push you on that anymore, Chris, because I I think it should be a secret. I think the I think the inspiration will come one evening, and I'm thinking, okay, let's ask those people i mean there's certain games i played back in the day and there's certain individuals i would love to come yeah yeah and i'm in touch with a lot of these guys it's just a matter of the right time you know picking the right time and the right you know if it if, it, if everything lines up and the date is there and people can make it the big games i played back then is obviously manic minor we all know who offered that but it was like the 3d games like star strike and you know games like that i remember playing a lot of. also like playing all the duel games I mean, Critical Mass was a big title I played back then. But so, you know, and I'm talking to some of the authors of these games. So let's, let's see, let's see what I can bring. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure they will go down just as well as Malcolm, Kevin and Clive. 
So moving on, I'm sure you'd like to thank your family and the other helpers who did a lot of work on the day and I guess helped organise the event as well. Yeah, so so the first first lot of people I went to when, when we had the idea of doing this, well, the Craig Turner and my, my friends from Revival Retro Events, which I was a part of back in the day. Those guys helped with the logistics, the putting the stuff out on the day. Craig did a lot of work as well on, on where everything would go and how it would fit into the, the original rooms and layout to, to the new layout plan then for, for, the new, for the new room. So he was a huge help, Craig, and, and, the, and the team behind that. We also had huge support from Retro Computer Museum in Leicester, Andy Spencer and the team. We borrowed off of them lots of speckies and lots of TVs, and they brought quite a lot of rarities as well, which we put into a couple of display cabinets, but they also had lots and lots of peripherals I don't know if you saw on the window in that yeah. area. Yeah. So people, I, I hear people doing this where they were saying, oh, I had one of those, I had one of those. And that, that was the idea. Maybe maybe not to use it, but to at least look at the box or see the item inside. So so RCM was a big th- was, was a big deal for us. And they, 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 they're going to be an ongoing partner, obviously Craig and the team. And then you've got the family, you know, as you said, my daughter welcomed people in. And then my, my elder daughter then was on the crash table. And then my wife was flitting around, helping everywhere and wherever she was needed. My son stayed at home and looked after the dog and played on his Xbox because he doesn't particularly like retro and he's 16 and doesn't quite get it yet. So, but, you know, he helped in his own way by looking after the dog for the day. So Rex had, <laughs> Rex was taking <laughs> the walks, yeah. I'd like to thank the stadium and the staff on the day were brilliant. You know, there were just those complications beforehand where there was a little bit of stress whether the event was on or not, you know. So, but they, they did us good on the day as well. Yeah, I, I agree, by the way. I was I was talking to some of them. I, I think I walked through to where the game was on, where you could see it. And a security guard came and asked me to, said, you can't you can't have alcohol in here when the game's on. Sorry, you'll have to ask you to leave. And it was probably the politest I've ever been asked something like that by a security guard. They were really, really good. And I guess there's also people to thank that turned up with hardware. Yeah, so RCM was a big was a big supply. Craig brought some of his arcade machines. Mike Mike Reese from Scotland came down with some machines, and then you had quite a few people. Then I th- I think everybody who was a part of the the teams that helped brought something in their boot just in case you know something failed or there, there was spares of lots of things. Alan Hamilton, who's who's does fusion with me and works very closely with me on on, on fusion retro boxes stuff he brought quite a lot of his personal kit for the fusion area there was this kind of device thing that turned your telly into a train i don't know if you saw that i didn't no <laughs> so it's a big thing in japanese things so he brought some oddities you know that people were playing so he was looking after that area i'm a big spectrum fan so if there was any excuse to you know buy a wafer drive or kempston mouse or multiple spectrums i did so I, I was saying in my head they were backups just in case something went wrong but the reality was it's just mm. lovely buying spectrum stuff isn't it there's so much of it you know i think i got every every keyboard going now with dk tronics low profile saga fuller i got them all but we put them out and and, and the idea was to give lots of different experiences of you know people I, I had a dk tronics keyboard back in the day but i'm sure many people had saga ones or fuller ones we also tried to get so this ocpr studio loaded with a kempston mouse and people could draw something and then print it to a printer so i learned a couple of things that day or or maybe remembered some of the the, the struggles you have on loading something from tape and that ocpr studio used lens lock and we just couldn't get it to work on the tv we just couldn't get the letters and then if you wait too long or try to do it for too long it just resets itself so the number of times we try to load that software which again, you know, it added, it added a, a flavor of experience to those watching because they could hear the, the the spectrum noises as it was loading the software. And then we had our tape loading error and then we had frustration on the damn thing. We couldn't get the lens lock to. But that's what we did back in the day, Jack, wasn't it? You know? Yeah. It was, just, it, was just, it was just recreating another experience we had. We couldn't get the damn thing to work. I remember release, getting it for Christmas, and having to load it three times before I worked out how to get the lens lock to work. Well, we still don't know why it didn't work. You know, it comes up on the TV. Maybe it was because it was an LCD screen, maybe, not, not a CRT, but, you know, we give up in the end. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the idea, you know, you have these visions of how something would be, and then it just doesn't come off on the day. Another thing I, I think I learned, and I'm still trying to prove this, is that you can get, you can maybe tell me, can you get a ZX? 
ZX81 version of the ZX printer, an AlphaCom32 printer? I, I thought they were just universal. I have no idea. So maybe some of your um, listeners could help. So when we put the printer in the back of the spec, we couldn't fit the Kempston interface into the back of the printer. It was too, it was, the slot was too small. I mean, back in the day, I had an AlphaCom32 printer plugged into my system with a Kempston mouse, and I would print things out. Because we, I was doing little bits of art for the the school kind of rag mag, you know, at the time. So I know I know that you could do it. It's just that the ZX printer we had and the AlphaCom thirty two printer we had, we we couldn't get the Kempston interface into the back of them. Maybe you need a Kempston interface with a through port so that you can then put the printer into the back of that. Who knows? But again, you know, challenges, you know, and still still some questions to answer, I guess, before the next one. So you mentioned the trouble with Warsaw and the FA Cup home draw. Were there any other challenges leading up to the event? I guess just time. As you know, we, we had 6,000 annuals turn up a few days before the event. And it was just a matter of juggling, I guess. The annuals were meant to come at the end of October, but they were a couple of weeks late. So we, what you had then, everything was banging into everything else. So we, we tried to get, we, I think we got about 4,000 of them sent out to Kickstarter backers and... Mm. It, it was trying to make sure we could sell them at the event, but not purposely upset the backers because they hadn't received their copies. So we we tried to send out as many as we could before the event, but it, it just meant that it was turning into the perfect storm, really. So it was a change of, it wasn't a change of venue, but a change of room in the venue. Then all these annuals turned up. Then then it was the railway strikes, you know? So there was all this kind of thing, all this stuff was happening all at the same time. So if, you know, I think I think considering everything came together in in a big bang kind of a way, it, it all kind of worked on the day. So I'm continuing now to try and clear up. Oh, and you've got Royal Mail strikes as well in the mix, because as I talk to you now, we've had like four days of Royal Day Royal Mail strikes in the last week and a half. So yeah, it, it was a time thing, I guess. It, 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 everything seems to take longer. As I said, we, we took all day on the Friday setting things up. We were there from like 10 in the morning till about half nine in the evening. And it, it was incredible how time just sort of floated by. And then we're thinking, crikey, are we going to get all these spectrums working? In, in the end, Wayne Robbins, um, Retro Robbins, was composite modding the spectrums on the fly because we could not get them to tune in via RF. That's what we were doing on the Friday. And then another thing we learned as well, we had a number of cub monitors, we had TVs, we had all different standards, LCDs, CRTs, and a cable from the spectrum into any of those. They're not all the same. <laughs> we learned that from Wayne as well. Well, that, that cable might look like this cable, but this is a blah blah and that's a blah blah This will never work with a plus two and a blah blah and And that's what we learned on the Friday as well. So brilliant. Wayne was brilliant. Yeah, he went round on the Friday, making sure in the end every spectrum tuned into a TV because the aim on the Saturday was, I, I said that every single device there had to have a game or something running on it, you know, and, and, and it had to be appropriate for the themed area like the early years, the classic years that was in. And Wayne and a few of the guys like Alan and others made, made sure that happened. But yeah, so we were there till half nine and then we were there again then from half seven on the Saturday morning because all the traders were arriving and, and then other people who, who like Alan Turvey and co were coming on that day. So we had to be there to make sure they knew where to go. So even though we spent a whole day setting up, there were still blank areas on in, in the in the room where people hadn't arrived yet. And then you're hoping they will arrive to do their thing, which they did. And then, and then by the time 10 o'clock came, I think we were, you know, in some cases things were, st were still set being set up a little bit but 98 percent or 99 percent of it was already there for people to play on so is there anything else you'd like to say about the events i just like to thank everybody who came and believed in what we were trying to do and um, being such gracious and I don't, I don't know such nice people what a great sin community the sinclair on spectrum community is you know Everybody was just so pleased to be there. And without them there on the day, it wouldn't have been at all special, really. Here would have been, you know, we, we put on a, a blank canvas. And it's those people who came who made made it as, a, it as successful as an entertaining, you know, as it was. And asking the guests the, the questions in the day and being a part of the evening thing and being really engaged and interested in, in what was being presented, you know. I, I I can't. I, I'm talking to the next team and Enrique and all all that a lot. They they, they said on my cuddle, they they said they could feel the love in the air. I, you, you could you could feel 
that everybody wanted to be there and maybe that's what the love in the air is you know that kind of i i can't really explain but you, you could you could feel that everybody was happy you could feel the joy you know of everybody being there and seeing all this stuff and being a being with people again i suppose after covid and lockdown and such i think i think everybody needed this because what we did we, we just put a, it was a blank canvas canvas really wasn't it and then people came and the interactions and the feedback and the talking and socializing is what made the event what the event was so yes yeah, so I'd, I'd like to thank thank all of the people that came i would like to thank people like your good self and paul and all the guests again who contributed to the day to make it as special as it was and all the people in the background then like rcm revival retro events all the people in my team as well fusion retro books all pulling together and and, and making sure it ran smoothly I think in some on some points of the event we we we, we may have looked like well ruffled swans on on the top of the water, but the legs were going like crazy just to make sure everything was ticking along okay. So yeah, so everybody and anybody that was a part of this, they they all made the crash live event what it was. Yeah, I I said to you, I think it was almost immediately that it was the next morning. It was the Sunday morning. The, I think it was the best event I've, I've been to, and maybe a bit of it was because it's the first event I've been to for several years. It's the first one I've been since COVID, and I, I agree. I think I think people needed that and needed to get out, and and I completely agree about feeling the love. There was a great atmosphere there for almost all the day. The the thing, the one thing I don't think you've mentioned much was the competitions. They were really good. They were always popular. There was quite often a crowd around the stage of people watching people compete and play those games. I think that was a really, really good idea, especially the way you did it. Yeah, so, I mean, Craig Craig looked after that to a degree because that's how he managed the competitions in the revival events in the same venue. Yeah. Wayne had the idea of doing a one-life Manic Minor, which I've, I've seen some video of that back because he took... He, he he took part in that. He's the one that created the, the the one life game, and he actually took part in that. And he didn't actually win, which was which was funny. Yeah, so, so, so the idea of the competitions. I mean, my idea was to have other games like Spy Hunter and Penetrator, and get games that if you haven't played for a while, you're not going to get very far. But, but then it's the, the slightly skilled people get a bit further. I think Wayne's idea was to have a way of the exploding fist competition but i don't think that materialized so there was lots of ideas of what would be on the day if i'm honest i don't know what games i knew manic minor one took place because i saw a video of it the bomb jack did mashed was mashed one of them because that was another game that was being touted oh yeah so i thought i saw hyper sports being played as well so the idea was competitions give a few prizes and then the other thing that took place on the day was the raffle and we managed to give um sort of put th- it was just under 300 pound we took um in terms of what we agreed we would give to m and d so we what we upped up to about 300 pound and the the prizes included three uh, original of a fray pieces of art as well as a a souped up harlequin blah de blah blah de blah in a suitcase with blah de blah blah de blah i could hear all the tech from from um from wayne uh, he donated that bless him to as a prize all, all i know we were, we were given lots of books out and signed this and signed that you know and the look on people's faces when they won Ollie's art and the Harlequin, to me, Ollie's art was was the best prize there because I, I I said to those who won it, that's there's no price on that, it's priceless. And then the Harlequin board has got you know is more more of a value because it's tech, isn't it? But, but the people who won those prizes of at least the three bits of art, they've been in touch and you know trembling with being overwhelmed, you know, now owning a bit of original art that. It's more difficult now to get hold of with all the with Ollie not being, you know, especially just winning a bit of art like that by paying five pounds for, you know, a couple of raffle tickets, you know. I'm hoping to replicate that again maybe next time as well because it's an opportunity for people who are fans to get something that Ollie created. So, yeah, so the so we, we donated £300 to MND, which is obviously a charity close to me and close to Rog, with Rog being in the latter stages now of this this, this horrible disease if you call if you want to call it a disease is a, is a horrible thing you know ollie got cancer and it took him very very quickly mnd it just it just sort of i don't know iller and Ill, iller and iller over a long period of time the blessing of ollie and, and how quickly it happened to ollie is, is a blessing i guess with rog he's 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 been suffering this for now for for two and a half years you know so is it it's, it's nice we can he, he's with us now to be able to see what we're doing and we're giving something back you know 
that is good and and yeah it, it only i remember reading only had passed away and it was kind of wow that's that's a shock i would have thought maybe if i read something it would have been about roger but yeah it's just a pity neither of them could have been there on the day no, I mean, I mean, the plan for the last couple of years, we knew Roger was was poorly, and there's there's there's, there's an inevitability with M and D. You know, there's only one path, yeah, but we don't know how long the path will take. So the idea was to to make sure Ollie was okay f- financially and the website, and unable to look after himself post Roger. And then Ro- Ollie got diagnosed with cancer in in March this year, and we lost him in in August and, and I think Rod, I saw Rog and Rog said to me it wasn't meant to be this way and you know it, it wasn't you know he Rog was comfortable that he was meant to be going before Ollie and this is what we were trying to do we were trying to put everything in place to make sure Ollie was okay you know post Rog so yeah so it, it, you know it is what it is I guess um, so Roger at the moment is quite active in supporting the m and association and and this, this is what we're doing as well we got a Just Giving page and I think we've raised nearly what three thousand six, three thousand seven hundred pound now from the Fusion Retro Books contributions, including the three hundred pound we put in from the raffle over the weekend. Hopefully, people hearing this will go and visit it and, and donate themselves as well. I'll be looking it up after this. Yeah, so if you looked up, I can't remember what the link is. Is, is if you look up Just Give in Re, uh, Fusion Retro Books, then it'll come up. You'll, you'll recognise the logo, and yeah, pl- please donate. It's a good cause. Um, I don't think it's going to help Rog in his lifetime, but it's it's something that needs to be researched a bit more, really, and yeah. and to help people in the future. And lastly, I'm sure everyone is wondering if there will be another clash, crash live event. A clash live event <laughs> yeah we'll rebrand clash <laughs> yes there will be it won't be in the venue that we've just used there's too much risk involved i think with football fixtures before crash there will be there will be a zap live so we're going to do that to cater for the zap 64 and zap amiga magazines and commodore fans and then it depends what happens after that so there's an idea of maybe combining a, a, an event where it, it incorporates Crash Live, Zap Live, Fusion Live, you know, wh- wh- wherever publications we have, or, or or it could be a different venue which caters for you know seven eight hundred people, very much like what we've just done. So there's definitely going to be a Crash Live event, but it could be incorporated as part of a bigger thing, or it could be independent. We haven't decided that bit yet. I think if you could, two days would be good. I think if you incorporate, if you did Crash and Zap. I don't know. I don't know if that has more complications, Chris. But <laughs> yeah, you've you, you got to add on that extra day if you think about it. There's the setup day, and so you, you've then got to factor in the cost because the, the venues tend to charge you the same price for each day. So if it was like five thousand pound for the Saturday, it would be five thousand for the Friday as well, and five thousand for the Sunday. So you're talking about fifteen grand then to put on an event. So it's all a balance of cost versus people through the door versus the time we need to set up, really. I think it's just good news that there'll be another event then, Chris. If it was two days, Grace. I'd, l- I'd love it to be two days. Uh, every event we've done, well, I've been a part of, has always been, there's always been a second day. Second day is never normally as busy as the first day because I think people get a little bit too sociable on the Saturday night. <laughs> so, But it's still, you know, it's just something, it's a quieter day normally. People tend to come for the Saturday, then go home, and then spend a bit of the Sunday, at least with the family. You know, with this one, we, we, we had the evening session, as I said, until about 11 o'clock in the evening. So if you came for 10, you were effectively there for like, you know, 13 hours at an event, which uh, is, is a, it's still a long day. And that maybe that works better than having it over two days. Yeah, but we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take your point on board, Jeff. I would have liked it to have been two days. I'm being selfish, Chris. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think with the two days as well, it, it, there's always that kind of taking everything down period. And I hate that part because part, that means it's all over. But we'll see. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure people will enjoy listening to this as much as I've enjoyed hearing you and chatting through the event. So if we do another Crash Live event, you, you guys are going to be incorporated somewhere in this. So would would you do a crash live episode all over again well, did, did you learn stuff from this we did yes we definitely we definitely did i funnily enough on the day we'd we'd rehearsed it and we'd taken almost exactly 45 minutes every time we rehearsed it and then on the day yeah we rushed it a little bit 
but I think that worked out well because after we'd finished, loads of people came up and wanted to talk to us, and we were talking quite a bit. And we had to clear down all of our equipment before I think it was Clive after us. Clive came on, and yeah, that extra time, that extra fifteen minutes, actually paid dividends. It was really, it was really useful. Having the extra time was really good. I think even though I felt we rushed it on the day, it actually was probably the right thing to do because we did it. But but I've already sent some ideas for another Spectrum show live to Paul. And I know Paul will have plenty too. Yeah, I mean, we had a completely rammed agenda from half... T- we got people in at 10 and then they started at half 10 with, with Joe from uh, the Portuguese Museum. Then you guys were on then. And then straight after you was, was Clive. Then straight after Clive, there was something else all the way through. So I was surprised, actually, by the end of the day, I think we only ran over about 20 minutes. We, we had a bit of contingency at the end of each talk for people to, to to talk to Malcolm, you know, Clive, you guys, and get some signed goodies and such. But it, that, that quarter of an hour at the end of a talk was was gold, really, wasn't it? We, it, we, needed, yeah. we needed that little gap between... Because uh, you can't just say, sorry, guys, you've all got to leave now. We don't want you to talk to Paul and Jeff. Everybody wanted to talk to the guests, yeah? And why not? There's some brilliant guests. Yeah, it was interesting. I watched your video on, on YouTube for it. And I, I, get, I guess you can practice as much as you want, but when you're in front of 120, 130 people... The, the, there's nerves, I guess. You speed up a little bit, don't you? So seasoned professionals behind the microphone, eh, Jeff? But when you're in front of a live audience, nerves gets the better of us all, doesn't it? It does. It was great to see that many people, though. When when we first started to set up, there were a few people filtered down to the front, and I thought, we might only have an audience of half a dozen here. And by the time we started, it was it was full right to the back. Yeah. People standing, which was nice to see. We need a bigger room. <laughs> yeah. 